Our scripture reading this morning uh, from John's Gospel is uh, chapter 19, uh, the first half of chapter 19, the, the continuation, the further of the uh, trial of Jesus before uh, Pontius Pilate. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robes, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Amen. By this time in our country, in our culture, whenever we hear about a, an airplane crash, we hear about a, an act of terrorism, we hear about a, 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 a ferry ship that has sunk, we hear about the collapse of a of an highway overpass, about a train wreck, about a shooting in a school, we immediately know that there is going to be a very intense investigation in which they are going to try to answer the questions, how did this happen? Who is responsible? Who's responsible for this? Uh, in part, uh, an attempt not just to lay blame, but an attempt to ensure that it doesn't happen again. But this morning, I want us to look at this text and, and the larger picture around it and ask the question, who's responsible for this? Certainly, tragic events are unfolding here. Jesus certainly did nothing to deserve this. He was a good man. He was the best of men. He was the perfect man, perfect in all of his ways. He treated others extremely well. He cared for and healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He comforted those uh, who were brokenhearted. He stood up against injustice and hurtful behaviors. And yet, in this passage, we find Jesus being beaten almost to death, it's a beating in preparation for, flagellation, for crucifixion, and oftentimes prisoners died in this process. And so as you look at this text this morning, I want to explore, as we said, who 
is responsible for this. Who is to blame? Well, the first and most obvious answer is Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is at blame. He was the, the governor of the Roman province of Judea. He had been appointed in 26 AD by the emperor Tiberius. He was his appointment, and he ruled in Judea until shortly after Tiberius' death in 37 AD. He, he ruled for a span of about 11 years. Historians like Josephus and Philo tell us that he was a very conscientious and capable administrator. He was, a good, he was good at his job, but he could be very antagonistic. He could be very obstinate, and especially when it came to the Jews and Jewish religious practices, he expressed a lot of animosity toward them. Not his best side, so to speak. I shared briefly last Sunday morning that Roman, the Roman government was very tolerant in, in general towards the, the peoples, the groups, the nations that they had conquered. They were very tolerant towards local culture, local society, to some extent local rule as well as local religious practices. But one thing that Rome would not tolerate was any form of rebellion, any form of treason. And they kept for themselves, and they used on a very regular basis what they oftentimes referred to as the edge of the sword. Interesting that they used the phrase the edge of the sword when they primarily crucified people, but they reserved for themselves the right to capital punishment, the right to execute. Now, they might turn a blind eye if a mob might raise up and lynch or stone or somehow in just a spontaneous act of disgust and, and hatred and outburst of violence might take someone's life, but they would not tolerate someone else holding a trial, convicting the person, condemning them to death and executing them. Romans would not allow that to happen. And so it's clear that this is an act of the Roman court. And it appears as though Pontius Pilate, as the governor, as the one who sat in the judgment seat, is responsible. He was exercising the power and the authority of the Roman government. But Jesus said, you know, Pilate, you wouldn't have any authority at all over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the ones who handed me over to you are even more guilty than you are. Jesus was saying, there's a higher authority at work here than you. And the ones who handed me over to you, they're even more at fault. They're even more guilty. They're even more responsible for these actions. So it appears as though Jesus is dismissing Pilate's responsibility. He's exonerating Pilate. Pilate himself went out and tried to wash his hands of the whole situation. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. And it was important in the, in the, in the uh, sharing of the gospel message that the blame was not laid at the feet of Pontius Pilate, that the, lame, the, the blame was not laid at the feet of the Romans. Why? Well, the Christians had to live and work under Roman authority. And how could they be allowed to continue to do that if they continued to say, and those mean, nasty, dirty Romans were responsible for this from beginning to end? 
the death of our Messiah. Rome would not have allowed that to happen, for them to continue to propagate that aspect of the message. Jesus dismissed. He said, Pilate, there's a higher authority at work. Secondly, in sharing the gospel message that missionaries went out around the Roman Empire, they were trying to draw Romans into the kingdom of God. They were trying to draw Romans to follow Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord. How could they expect a people group to respond to them, their message in that way if they continued to lay the blame fully at their feet? No. No. Jesus said, it's not Pontius Pilate. He said, there's an even more guilty party in our picture, and that is the Jewish leaders and people. They're even more guilty. They're even more responsible for what's going on here than Pontius Pilate and the Roman authority. It was the high priest Caiaphas who had dreamed up this whole plan. It was the high priest Caiaphas who... At the end of John chapter 11, following the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and lots of people, John says, lots of people put their faith in Jesus when they saw that happen, buddy. When he could raise the dead, it got their attention. And it was Caiaphas who said, it would be best for the nation. It would be best for one man to die for the whole nation, then for the whole nation to perish. He must not say this on his own, but as high priest, he, uh, John chapter 11 says, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. I, I, I asked the question, I said, what's going on here? What's going on here? What, what's, what's Caiaphas trying to do? Well, from one perspective, from his perspective, Jesus was dividing the Jewish people. He was dividing the Jewish people, those who were interested in following the new way that Jesus was revealing versus those who were willing to follow the traditional way. And they said, this is causing a split in our people. And if he is successful enough, he is going to raise up a whole new nation. And we can't let that happen. But if we have him put to death, it will stop the division from happening. This is their thinking. It'll stop the division from happening. It'll be, you know, if we, if we cut off the head of the snake, the snake will die. If we cut off the leader, the movement will die and the nation will be reunited under our authority, of course. If Jesus was allowed to continue, certainly his influence and following would grow. They knew that. And we have some interesting data about that in the gospel or in the uh, account of, of uh, Acts. In Acts chapter 2 at the end following the day of Pentecost it says and 3,000 people 3,000 people one day gave their lives to following Jesus Christ. And then the next chapter says and the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Also, there would be a union of the country because they thought, I think they thought, that the Jewish people would continue to lay the blame at the feet of the Romans. 
they had no trouble expressing their displeasure with Pontius Pilate, to Pontius Pilate, about Pontius Pilate, and they would rally together against Roman leadership, Roman authority, and that would solidify the nation. But Jesus said these people are, are carrying a greater guilt their greater guilt is demonstrated by the fact that they're perpetrating an outright, outright lie. He claims to be a king. Jesus never did that. He's trying to lead a rebellion. He's trying to establish his own kingdom right here on earth. Jesus never tried to do any of that. They were perpetrating an outright lie. They were seeking injustice. They participated in two illegal trials held at night. And witnesses for the defense were not invited to the proceedings. Only the prosecution was allowed to make its case. It was a grave act of injustice. And they used coercion. They used coercion. They said to Pontius Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. You are no friend of Caesar's if you release this man. Tiberius may have been Pontius Pilate's benefactor in appointing him to that position, but Tiberius had also heard some bad reports about Pilate. And Pilate knew that his standing was somewhat tenuous. Somewhat tenuous. Their guilt was even greater. Their guilt was even greater because they were the moving force behind what's unfolding before us. And it was driven by lies and injustice, and coercion. But Jesus said, nope. I don't even want to lay it at these people's feet, even though they have a greater guilt. He said, there's a higher authority that is at work here from above. From above. Ah. Please stand by. I am missing this is part of my sermon notes. Ah, oh, there they are. They're out of order. That'll do it. From above, from above, from above. And Jesus knew that it was from above that these actions were unfolding. Just the night before, he had prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if you are willing, take this cup, the cup of God's wrath, away from me, yet not my will. Your will be done. Three times he had prayed this prayer. And finally he said, enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of sinful men. The purposes of God were being fulfilled in the unfolding of these events. And the purposes of God were to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the world, to offer a sacrifice for your sins, and for mine. We are the responsible party. We are the responsible party. Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We are the responsible party. It was our sins, it's our actions that caused 
God to send Jesus to the cross. It was not an accident. It was not a mistake. It was not a miscarriage of justice. It was a loving, sacrificial act of God. Christ died for us. The shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world was sacrificed for us. We are responsible. Christ died to reconcile us with God, to make us right with God. The beneficial purpose of his death is reconciliation. There was a great gulf. There is a great gulf between God and humanity. A gulf created by sin. And the purpose of this death was to make a way of reconciliation between those two parties. To span that gulf. Christ died for our sins. He died to pay the penalty for our sins. Only God can forgive sins. Only God has the power and the authority. Only God could lay down his life for us. We go into... uh, Oh, come on. We go into a, a restaurant. And especially in the you know, late fall, winter time, you've got a coat on, you think, well, I'll, I'll hang. We don't, you don't see that so much anymore, but I'll, I'll hang it here in the cloak room, in the coat area, you know? But oftentimes there's a little notice on the wall that says, the management is not responsible if it gets lost or stolen. Or you... Park your car in a parking garage, and as you're exiting the garage to do your business, there's a sign. The management is not responsible for any items lost or stolen from your vehicle. You buy a, 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 an airplane ticket, and there's fine print in the contract that says the airline takes no responsibility for delayed or missing connections. If your baggage is lost, they have to pay an amount agreed upon by some convention that took place in 1955. And they pay you in 1955 dollars. No one wants to take responsibility. It's just like the little girl who was sent into her room for misbehaving Sometime later, her mother walked down the hallway past the door, and she heard the little girl in there praying, talking to God. And the little girl says, God, I'm stuck in here because of you. You know that, don't you? Last night, I prayed for you to help me be a good girl, and you didn't do it. So it's your fault. (laughs) We don't want to take responsibility. Who's responsible for this? Pontius Pilate? He was just a tool in God's hands. The Jewish leaders and the Jewish people, they have greater guilt, but again, they were just tools in the hands of God. It's you and me that are responsible for this act. It is our sins that are responsible for nailing Jesus, for nailing Jesus to the cross. But the good news is that God knew, God knows that we are guilty sinners, and the death of Jesus was his plan, was his plan for our our salvation. Christ died for us. Christ died to reconcile us to God. Christ died for our sins, for our redemption, for our forgiveness. Christ died to take upon himself our punishment and his peace is upon us. The best thing that we can do, the best thing that we can do 
is to acknowledge is to acknowledge our responsibility. For in confessing our sin and acknowledging our responsibility and acknowledging that this is God's means of providing for our salvation, it fulfills and it glorifies, it exalts, it affirms the message of the gospel. And so when we pray a prayer like this, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will. In your name I pray. When we pray a prayer like that, we affirm Christ did not die in vain. And we put the death of Christ in its proper place, in its proper perspective. Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The greatest glory that we can give is to embrace the message of the cross, to embrace the sacrifice that was offered on the cross for our behalf. The greatest way that we can give glory to Jesus Christ is to bow our knee before him, acknowledge our guilt, accept and receive his forgiveness and commit our lives to following him. If you've not done this, let me invite you to do so this morning. The prayer is right there. The Spirit of God is here in this place this morning. Perhaps you might say, well, Pastor, I prayed that prayer a long time ago. But sin has a way, like mice, of coming in and eating away. at the cheese, of eating away at the storehouse, of eating away of that experience. And it doesn't hurt us from time to time to renew, to renew that commitment, to renew that surrender of our life to Christ. And so I encourage you, if you need to, if you desire to, to pray that prayer this morning to affirm the importance, to affirm your responsibility for the death of Christ, and to affirm your faith in that this is indeed God's answer to our greatest need. I was going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes, but you can't see the prayer if you do that. So let us just enter into a time of prayer this morning. And if you need and you desire to do so, let me invite you in the silence of this moment just to pray that prayer or something like it if God's Spirit is calling you in that direction this morning. Father, as we consider, and we have considered who's responsible for the death of Jesus, there's something very human in our response that says, not me, wasn't me. But we know that the exact opposite is the truth. It's our sin that caused you to send Jesus to the cross. And we thank you this morning that you did so. And we thank you this morning that through faith in that sacrifice, you offer us forgiveness and a new life and a new loyalty. Go with us as we embrace Jesus as our Savior, 
as our Lord. Go with us and guide us in new pathways of righteousness to his glory. Thank you.